Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, Westgate webinar. So this is the second in a series of uh, fall webinars. Uh, these run every second Wednesday. And today's presentation is going to be by Camille Masinkowski. Uh, so Camille is a Westgate site lead and system analyst uh, at the University of uh, Alberta. And he's going to talk about common job submission errors and how to avoid them. So this is going to be intended for users who are already familiar with the basic Sloom scheduler commands. And uh, let me also tell uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, notes. So um, if you have a question, uh, you can always ask a question uh, via video if you're using a video client, web or desktop client. So to do that, you uh, can find a group of icons at the bottom and the one on the right that says in call chat. If you click on it, it will open a chat window where you can uh, ask questions uh, via well, using keyboard. Uh, but make sure you don't click on the next button to it, which is a share button. Otherwise, you, you'll be sharing your desktop. So if you're watching via web stream, um, you don't have access to uh, the video client, but you can send us an email uh, to info at westgrid.ca. Once again, info at westgrid.ca and I'll be monitoring incoming emails. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, please mute, mute your microphone. And you can always unmute it to ask a question by audio as well if you want. So on that note, I will pass the microphone to Camille. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so this is uh, you know, a talk about how to deal with uh, common scheduling problems. Uh, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so please bear with me if uh, you know, it's either too long or too short or there's issues with it. Um, so we'll begin. So one of the first things that uh, you're going to want to do um, if you're having a uh, scheduling issue is that you're going to want to gather the, the data that you're actually having. So you're going to want to keep any error messages that you received. You're going to want to know what environment settings were set, which module did you have loaded, and when you submitted the job, right? When did the problem occur? You want to keep things like the state of the cluster, because the state of the cluster changes, job start and finish, notes fail and are repaired. And uh, you may want to know what were the output of the commands that you ran on the system when you run them, right? What made you think that there is a problem on the system? So you're going to want to keep this information for yourself and also for anybody that might want to help you. So one cool way to do this is to use the script command. So if you type in script and a file name, uh, that will write out everything that you see on the command line. Uh, and the cool thing, one other thing is if you script minus A, it will actually append to a file. If you put today's date in there, that's even better to keep track of it. So if you just do script, set problem October 3rd, I am now inside command. I could type in ls. I could type in up minus u user to see what uh, stuff I'm running. I could quit. If I want to quit the script, I type an exit. There's a new file created. We can then do a less of the file. The less minus r of the file. See that, and then we could see everything that was done, all the commands that were done. So that will be really good for you to keep track of what's going on uh, when you are debugging a problem and also showing the next person what's happening. So this is something that I use when I'm trying running down problems with a vendor, with anything. This way we, we could keep track of what's going on. So that's one big recommendation for you guys. It's more of a meta recommendation about how to fix problems in general. So let's start with some of the most common ones, memory requests. So the memory that your job requests is what the system must have available for your job to use. Now, 
that may see, seem trivial, but it's actually not. Because if your job requests to use 1.5 terabytes, uh, it, will, it will never run on a node that has 1.5 terabytes of RAM, as some of the RAM must be used by the operating system. And then there will be, not be enough resources to run your job. So when you guys look at how big the nodes are on the cluster and think that you can actually run in the, the, on those nodes, you have to leave a little bit space for the operating system. If you don't, then your job will not actually run on those nodes. So that's a big one that a lot of people run into. So what we recommend is that all the requests for RAM is done in thousands of megabytes. Basically, a gigabyte is uh, 10,024 megabytes. If you ask for what's it called, uh, 1.5 thousand Uh, or if you ask for 4,000 megabytes on a typical node, there will be 24 times 4 megabytes left over for the operating system, and that will actually be enough, right? Same with the larger nodes. If you ask for, what's it called, 1.5 million megabytes instead of 1.5 terabytes, there's going to be 72 gigabytes left over, or 70 gigabytes left over to run the operating system and other services. So this is recommended when you're running large jobs and when you're running smaller jobs. Just ask for, thousands, for memory in thousands of megabytes. This way, there's enough memory left over for the operating system and you're not gonna be worrying and wondering why your job doesn't run. Okay. By the way, please free to ask questions. Yeah. Okay. So, that's my first big tip for you guys. Uh, another tip about running out of memory. So if you run your job and it runs out of memory, well, then you need to ask for more memory. However, you have to be careful when you do this. Asking for more memory makes your job more difficult to schedule because it's asking for more resources that have to be available. And not all nodes have, may, may not have enough memory to run your job, like nodes or servers. So if your job asks for more memory, then it may be limiting itself to a smaller number of machines that it can run on. So you don't want to ask for too much, but you want to ask for enough. Now, compute kind of clusters have only four gigabytes of RAM per core on most nodes. Uh, so that would be nice if you could aim your jobs about that size. Uh, you could ask for more memory than the cluster. Oh, another thing you could do is you could ask for more memory than the cluster has. So you could ask for, you know, six terabytes of RAM on some cl on clusters, and uh, that's always possible if you're using Slurm uh, or any other scheduler for that matter. I think the scheduler will just optimistically think that some system admin will purchase new hardware and install it, and your job will run. So you have to be careful that you don't ask for more memory than the cluster has, or for more memory than it's reasonable to get, right? Uh, Cedar has only four three terabyte nodes. If you ask for one of them, you may be waiting a lot of time. Uh, another thing that's important to understand when you're asking for too much memory is that your group will be assessed as having used more resources for the purposes of priority and allocation if you ask for more memory. So on that, here's how it's done. Basically, since the average node on Compute Canvas systems has four gigabytes of RAM, we calculate something called a core equivalent. It's basically a bundle of a core and four gigabytes of RAM. Now, if you use, and the way it's calculated is basically, it's the maximum, either the number of cores or the amount of memory that you use divided by four. So if you use, in this example, two cores with four gigabytes of memory, well, that's counted as using two core equivalent. However, if you use two cores and 10 gigabytes of memory, well, that's two cores worth of cores plus 10 gigabytes divided by four. So you, we're using basically two and a half cores worth of memory or 2.5 core equivalent. So that may not seem big right here, 
But if you ask for three terabyte node, oh, that uses a lot of memory, right? So, yeah, like, if you ask for three terabytes of memory and one core, I think that's somewhere around 900 cores worth of uh, ask, uh, as calculated as usage. Those nodes are really, really rare. They use really, really expensive RAM. So they're far, far more expensive than a typical compute node. So they are charged for more. And we have much, much less of them. And by charging, we mean not that you know, your PI will get a bill. It's just that your group will have been considered to have used more resources. And when the scheduler determines which group runs, uh, that number will be used in that determination. So, okay. Any questions on this? Okay. Please uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question if you have it. The TIs could also speak up if there is a question. The next thing. Look at the, the node types on Cedar. So here is a description of the different node types on Cedar. Now, Cedar has 640 nodes with 48 cores and 4 gigabytes per core another 560 nodes with 32 cores and four gigabytes per core. That basically means that 86.7% of all the nodes on Cedar have four gigabytes per core. Um, there is another 182 higher memory nodes with eight gigabytes per core and with each with 32 cores. That composed of another 10.3% of Cedar. Now, if you're going to use more than eight gigabytes of memory per core, we're, now we're looking at only 3%, 3% of the regular nodes on Cedar that's the, uh, that are remaining of the, of the large memory users usage. So these numbers, <laughs> these, um, the limit of eight gigabytes per core, right? That's an important one. Because if you're asking for a lot more memory than that, you're going to be running only on those 3% of nodes. Um, you have to be, you have to understand that there's a lot less of these nodes. It's much more likely that your job will take a much longer time for your job to run. Now, even along the large memory nodes, there is a big difference. There's 24 nodes with uh, basically 16 gigabytes per core, 500, what's well, a half a terabyte of RAM in total. There's another 24 nodes with 48 gigabytes per core or 1.5 uh, terabytes. And there is only four nodes or 0.2% of the entire cluster that has 96 gigabytes per core or three terabytes of RAM. So if you're asking for a large amount of RAM, there is a limited number of nodes. So you may want to look at how much memory you're asking. Now, if you really need that, then you need it. You need those rare resources. If you don't, you really do not want to be asking for more memory than, than what's it called. You need, especially if you cross any of these boundaries because that will have a profound effect on how many jobs you can run. Yeah. And also in general, uh, you may want to actually ask for less than four gigabytes or 4,000 megabytes per core, because sometimes some other people may ask for more and there may be, you know, parts of the cluster that your job could fit into. So you should only ask for enough memory for your job to run, uh, or slightly a little bit more so that, you know, there is no danger of your job uh, being killed because there's not enough memory. 
because that will make it much easier for your job to run. Now, there's one other thing. If you are asking for a large memory job and you're asking for, there's only a limited number of nodes, especially the three terabyte nodes, there's four of them. Now, some of these nodes are reserved for short running jobs, you know, available within 24 hours. You can't run a job longer than 24 hours. Some of these nodes are capable of running really, really long running jobs. Now, if we let all nodes, all jobs run really, really long, then these nodes, these servers will be filled with really long running jobs. And the people that need a short job to run as part of their workflow would not be able to use it, right? They would have to wait a month to get one of these nodes. So it, it matters not just how long your job is, uh, sorry, how big your job is, but also how long it runs. So you have to be careful. Also, if you ask for nodes by node only, uh, there's a, some nodes that are reserved for that. If you ask for by core, so if you ask for, I just like one core with a whole bunch of RAM, then you will be put into the by core partitions here at the bottom, and that's less nodes that your job could run. So you want to basically uh, understand this, and especially if you're a large memory user, you also might want to contact uh, support at uh, Compute Canada if you're having issues with this, uh, because it is somewhat complex. So one other thing. Uh, we're going to go over some commands to see what uh, is going on with your program to how to, uh, how to ask for what's it called uh, memory. Just understand two things. Max RSS is the amount of memory used by your code. Max VM size is basically the requested uh, memory block for your code. So we're going, to find, we're going to go through a few commands that you could use. There is stat, which basically displays the information on running job. You could do stat minus J with a job ID. Uh, stat is going to give you a large amount of information. You probably want to use the minus, minus format one just to give you the information that you need, the max RSS size, the max VM size. S account also does that. It just displays slimmer counting data. So this information won't be there until your job finishes. Uh, you could do it minus J and the job ID or minus U username. You also want to have the same formatting. And your other alternative is to use SALloc. And SALloc is basically like SBatch, except that you could run a job interactively. So we'll go into a job and actually see how this is done. Uh, when you are running interactively, you're basically going to want to uh, what's it called, maybe print your environment variable and look at uh, the job just as if it was a regular Unix job. So let's go in. Okay. So here we have a program called Cryptic. So a colleague of mine, which has retired now, wrote it. Uh, I don't know what it does. It does something, it uses some memory. Uh, so in, in this example, it's just as if uh, you received some code to run and you wanted to run it uh, from a colleague of yours, uh, the same thing here. So Uh, 
here we have a very simple, what's it called, uh, script. It basically starts with uh, four tasks, four cores, and it runs my little cryptic uh, script. Now, I could tell you in advance that this will not actually be enough. So we've submitted a job. SQ to user. That's basically just show my jobs. And we can see that it's running. It should die pretty soon. Now, how can we fix this problem? Well, one thing that we can do is, especially if we, we want to run the same pro problem over and over again, let's say we have some software package and we want to run models in it all the time and we want to figure out roughly how much our model takes and then ask for the same thing over and over. Well, we can just ask for a lot more, right? So we can go into our script. Let's ask for eight. Yep. There should be an error just as soon as the scheduler catches up with us. But okay. Let's say we want to get this information. Well, currently the running job. We could use SDAT to see the attributes of the job that has already run. Um, if it works, um, we seem to be having a little technical difficulty here. Uh, there, we're getting an error out of our statistics. Uh, out of the slurred slur statistics uh, is not. Uh, giving us <coughs> oh our first job has finished though so we can actually look at There may be an issue because our jobs were quite short. Yeah, and 
the statistics were not actually gathered, unfortunately, for this short little job. Um, if it ran longer, it would it should have given us um, just the amount of uh, memory that it actually used and needed. Here we see one of those give us zero, unfortunately. So now we will. Okay, I can't demo it for you. If we had a much longer running job, uh, we would we should be able to do that. But I will demo you the third way we can actually do the same problem. So instead of running the job with s batch, we could actually do the same thing with a command line s alloc minus basically the same field that we used. At task equals four, member CPU equals, say, 4,000, time equals 20. This is how we run an interactive job. So the great part here is we could be actually in the job and see the information using regular Unix utilities. And, of course, I actually have to run it. Oh, account correctly. So in here, just like uh, an S batch, if I have more than one accounting group, uh, you have to specify an accounting group. So I've just been allocated a job. It should, it should put me into a node very, very quickly. Yep. We've just logged into Cedar 767. So, you know, we run hostname. We could see that we are in Cedar 767. We can run our cryptic command. Now it runs rather quickly. We'll try to run. Yes, I'm running top now. And we can actually see here that Cryptic is running. We can use top or any of the other Unix utilities while a program is running to see how much memory it's using. So this one is using just slightly over three gigabytes of RAM right here. We can see res and virtual. So max RSS or the required memory there, and how much virtual memory, basically how much was requested by the program versus how much it's used. So we can actually see that information here. Uh, we could use any of the Unix uh, utilities to see what's going on with your job. So top is a really cool way of using it. We can also do other things. So we can go and uh, this is a really advanced Unix thing. So there's something called C groups. It, it, it's the feature of Unix that prevents your job from stepping on other jobs and vice versa. There is a separate C group that's created for each job. So you could actually see uh, what's it called, uh, all the information on there, including which tasks, i.e., which processes are running. 
what is my shell? You can see here that the shell that we are actually running inside this C group. Uh, you can actually see things like memory pressure and all kinds of information about this little container that, you're, that you are running in. Um, if you're using too much uh, memory or if you're doing other things, more, co more complex and advanced problems, you can actually look inside the C group if you have the Unix knowledge and uh, see what's going on there. Um, if you don't, you may want to contact uh, support at Compute Canada support at Westgrid, and this is what the analyst would look at when your job is running, potentially. Uh, but that's a rather advanced way of doing it. I mean, we could just look at top, right? So top basically just shows you what's running, what processes are running on the machine that you're running on. It's a uni regular Unix command. And if you just want to limit it to the user, you can do that as well. So you can see that I am just one of the users here on this interactive node. There is somebody else that's running. Okay. Now, if you want to quit out of the interactive job, you do Control D or exit, and it actually you know finishes it. And this is the same thing that you do to get out of the script command. You do control D or exit. Uh, if you're in both, you may have to do it twice. So, okay, that's memory. Um, what if you're running out of runtime? Well, you have a quite similar occasion. Ask for more runtime. But once again, don't ask for too much runtime. So it's all a, very much a balance. Asking for more runtime may limit how many resources you could run your job on. And this may interact with how much memory you've asked for. So what we have on Compute Canada is we have a number of partitions and they're sort of nested. Basically, your nodes can run, how many nodes or servers that your job can run on. If your job requires 28 days, or actually more than seven days, you have to run into the 20 day, eight day or less partition. And that is only a small subset of the nodes. Um, if you ask for seven days or less, it's much bigger. 72 hours or less, it's much bigger, and so on. So the partitions are based on the maximum wall time your job has. So your job ends up in the shortest wall time partition that is longer than your job. The shorter, the, the shorter wall time partitions include all the nodes with the longer wall time partitions. So basically, they're concentric. So a node, a server that's available for to run 28 day long jobs will also be capable of running 72 hour long jobs. So, be careful on these boundaries, right? Don't ask for 72 hours and five minutes because that will put you into the one week long queue, right? If you can get away with asking slightly less, you know, if your job only requires 68 hours and you ask for 73, uh, you're going to get a lot less nodes potentially that your job can run on. So be aware of these uh, partition limits that we have set up on Cedar and Crown, and Beluga in the future. Uh, once again, there is an interplay between how long your jobs are and the large memory. So if there's only four nodes, as there are of the three terabyte prior ID on Cedar, uh, well, there's limits here. So they're really expensive. If you're doing large memory ones, you have to watch out for both. having issues, of course, you can try yourself as well, contact the uh, support of Compute Canada. Uh, there is a script called partition stats, so you can do that. You 
run it. Basically, it just shows us some information about the partitions that we have. Now, as we can see, Cedar is somewhat slow. Um, it's not responding very well. So we'll go to here. We'll discuss this one here. So this is an older one. Um, basically, it has a number of sections. So the way you would read this is you have a three-hour partitions, 12-hour partitions, up to 24, up to 72, up to 168, and up to 28 days. And basically, we have a number of things. We have, first of all, the, no, uh, uh, the number of nodes available for running whole node jobs and the number of nodes available for running by core. So at this time, there was actually one job in a three-hour partition of the, on the regular sized uh, jobs that ask for a whole node and 15 jobs that ask for a core, right? That's the number of jobs that were queued. Uh, you can actually see that there was actually 60 jobs of that type that were actually running already. Uh, and we can see that the number of idle nodes, in this case, there was zero. And at the bottom here, we can see how much of those node types are available in total. So that type of job could actually run on 851 nodes, so quite a few. So this is how you would read information about, um, what's it called? How many nodes are available for what type of usage, right? At the time, if you're asking for a job that required 24 hours, there was, and for a whole node, then there was 756 nodes that were available. Although they were all running jobs at that time. We can actually see that, it, uh, that uh, our partition stats has actually finished. And we can see that there's actually more, much more nodes available right now. So that uh, slide was before the upgrade. Now asking for 72 hours and a whole node would give you uh, up to 958 uh, jobs. Sorry, 958 nodes of that type are there. And there's even one that is idle, uh, probably because somebody's asking for to run using two or more nodes, and it's just gathering uh, resources. Uh, but this is a neat script that you could use to see the status of the cluster. Uh, another thing, so your job is running right now. So you want to tell, see why your job isn't running right now. Well, what you can do is you can run S control show job, job ID. So it will give you a whole bunch of information, including job state and reason. So be very careful about that. Also, you could look at partition stats to see how many jobs are in that queue how many are queued, how many are running of that type, how many nodes are available in total. Uh, and you could look at the jobs priority with the sprio command. So let's show that. We can submit our job. Oh, Cedar seems a bit slow. There it is. So we do S control show job. if we spell as control properly. Oh, okay, so here we see that that job has already started. So my job is quite short. Uh, if you have really short jobs, it's probably easy to start your job because there's 
resources. So it has already started. So that's the job state. It says it's already running. It actually gives you information on your priority as well. Now, if it wasn't running, it would give you a reason right here. And that reason will tell you, well, there's not enough resources or your priority is too low or something like that. Or your job uh, can't run because many of the other reasons. All those reasons, you know, you could pay attention to that. That could give you some information about uh, why. Okay. The other one is Esprio. If you run Esprio, you can actually see your job ID and the priority. And you can actually look at all the jobs priority and figure out where your job fits in. So you can determine the reason why your job isn't running it could potentially be priority. And this is how you would get this information. Now priority comes from a number of factors. So some priority can come from the fact that your job is sitting in the queue for a long time. It will gain a little bit of priority because it's been sitting in the queue. Some of it, most of it will come from fair share. So that's based upon how much allocation you have. And well, we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> in the next slide. And actually, so fixing priority. So priority is based upon your group's recent usage mostly compared to the allocation in the recent and th this is in the recent past. So you want to wait and ask, so how do you fix this? Well, you could wait and ask your group members to use less resources. So it's about your group's usage. So your group's usage is compared to, you, to your group's allocation. So if somebody in your group is running a lot and you have a job that's not getting to run, you may ask them to you know, use less resources, right? That's one option. Another option is ask your PI to apply for a resource allocation competition allocation, a RAC allocation. So the RAC call for proposals is out right now. And if your PI writes a proposal, uh, or if you are the PI, if you write a proposal, then you could get a lot allocation. And therefore that allocation will be compared to your group's usage. So your group will be able to use that amount of resources that you're allocated. And the third thing that you could fix this is you could change your resource, you could change your job to ask for resources that are in less demand. So what you could do is checkpoint. So notice that although there's lots of jobs in the queue, my jobs were starting really, really fast. Well, that's because they were really, really short. So one way you could take advantage of that is you could use checkpointing, right? So some programs can, stay, can save their state and restart from the state state, right? And if that doesn't take too long, then this allows a running job to be broken up into smaller runs, very long ones. Like, like we only allow up to, up to 28 days of runtime. Some people need calculations that could take six months to run in total. Uh, but at that point, you need to break up your job your calculations into smaller pieces. If you can do that, then that's great. It also minimizes the effect of hardware failures and system downtime on your ability to get work done. So um, if there is a security fix that we have that the, the cluster admins have to take down the cluster to fix, or there's a hardware issue, if you're asking to run very, very long, they may have to take that down and all your work until that point may be uh, go away. If you checkpoint, you have the ability to restart from the last time you saved. So that's a really great feature if the software that you have supports it. Or if you are writing your application, if you put that feature into the application that you are writing. Right? Uh, the other thing that you want to check that is how long does it take to save? So if your job needs to run for three days, but takes one day to save, then you know maybe it doesn't make sense to save it, right? 
if it takes five minutes to save, then maybe you should be saving every eight hours, right? It's a trade-off that you have to look at. So here's the thing. Big high priority jobs in the scheduler leave holes that can be filled with smaller jobs. So in here, we have an example of a one node cluster. We see some jobs that are gonna be, that are already running in blue. We see some bigger jobs that are being scheduled in red. We notice that there are actual holes in here. Basically, because we're trying to run these type of jobs on this cluster, you know, even the highest priority job, number one here, that requires four cores. Well, it can only start until the middle of day four, um, and so on. So before that, there's a hole. It could be filled in with other jobs. But if your jobs are actually small, if they take only a few hours to go, let's see, and three hours is a good uh, one to use, then your job will be able to fit in where other jobs can't. If you can do that, it doesn't matter what the priority is, or you will only be competing with other users that are running three hour long jobs. You can actually get a lot of runtime without even needing a rack allocation. So if you could checkpoint, then you know, you're much, much better off. This is like the best practices for running jobs in general both because of the advantages to your priority, but also because of the robustness that you don't have to worry that, you know, the cl cluster will crash or your job will crash and, you know, you will lose months of work. So you want to do this if you can. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. So <laughs> I'm gonna add, one other thing. So how to ask support for help? Well, first of all, you should read the status page and any support notice. So there is status.computecanada.ca. And on that website, you will be able to uh, look at the status. So if the system is having hardware issues, uh, then it should be up there and uh, you could look that up. However, what's it called? Beyond that, you may want to ask uh, support at Compute Canada for help or support at Westgood. So, but being able to ask for help in a helpful manner will likely result in your questions, what's it called, being answered in a much more responsive manner. So an email that says something is wrong, nothing works, it's gonna take a long time to resolve, right? It's gonna take a long time for somebody to figure out which system it's broken, what is the issue, with what is it, right? Uh, if you put in, you know, job one, two, three, four, five, six fails to run on Cedar cluster, the Cedar admins will see it immediately. The other thing that you wanna do is don't make the analyst play detective unnecessarily. Compute Canada has many different clusters. Your Compute Canada username may not be apparent from your email. You may have hundreds of jobs in the queue running or completed, right? Or failed on a system. Which one did you have an issue with? When did this happen? And here's another one. Which job script did you use to launch your job? Have you modified since you've actually launched your job? What versions of software are you running? So here is an example of what you should do. Send message to support at Computer Canada. You know, have a sub subject that has something like job one two three gives errors on the Cedar cluster. Put in, you know, hello, my name is A Smith, or Alice, my user A Smith. Today at ten, uh, I submitted the job one two three four five six on the Cedar cluster. The job script is located in give a path. I have not changed it since submitting the job. Since it's short, I'll include it here. You can also list the modules that were loaded during the runtime do a module list. Uh, you could say the job run quickly and it received uh, the output. Uh, 
what's it called? There was no output in the dot out file, but the error message said, you know, job one two three four five six on theater node six nine two was cancelled uh, time due to time limit. Can you help me fix this problem? Uh, such a, su such a thing would be beloved by the <laughs> analyst because they could easily determine what is the problem and understand what's going on. If they have to play detective, it's really, really difficult. It takes a while to answer your questions. In here, you know, it's much more or less. So one thing that you can do is when you do run script, right? You can take the output and you can do a few things in here. Do a module list, which modules you have loaded. Do a printf to show your environment, do an ls, you know, where you're running. Uh, this is all really, really useful information, right? Do an sq minus u user. All the commands that we've run, you can actually put it into the script, and you can at this point, analysts or other people, your coworkers, can actually look through and see exactly what you saw. A lot of stuff on the cluster changes. You know, nodes break, nodes are fixed, jobs finish, jobs are submitted. If we want to see, if you want somebody else to see what you saw to, to potentially see a, a fix a problem then you're going to want to give the information that was there at the time, right? The same thing as, you know, you have a problem with your car. There is, you know, some weird noise in your car. You go to your car mechanic and the noise doesn't occur. If you could somehow, you know, get that information so the mechanic can actually see what's going on with your car, it's much easier to help you out at that point. So, that's through the main portion of the of the event. Uh, do you guys have any specific uh, questions? Because nobody has volunteered to ask a question yet. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, in my group, uh, we are working on uh, MPI implementations. Uh, so, for example, MVAPISH Open MPI. And uh, I know that there are some uh, MPI implementations like OpenMPI or Intel MPI already installed in, uh, in Compute Canada resources, but uh, we need to install our own version of MPI implementation uh, like NYPH. Uh, I uh, could do that on uh, some other resources uh, like Niagara or Graham, uh, but uh, when I install my own version of uh, MPI implementation on CDR, it is compiled, mm -hmm. but when I submit the job, I get some errors like uh, core affinity errors. I'm not sure if there's a problem with the scheduler when I'm using my own version or there's something else, but I couldn't uh, run my code on CDAR. Well, so one thing that you can do is you could ask the analyst to install the version. If you need a specific version of uh, MPI, you can make a request to support at Compute Canada for somebody to install them centrally, right? That would be available, mm -hmm. that version would then be available on Cedar, Gram, Niagara, all of it. The yeah, other but, thing uh, I can think of. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. But the problem is that because I debug the code, I uh, add some things to the code and I make uh, change the data structure and give the stuff in MPI mm -hmm. implementation. So um, uh, I might need to compile it several times in a day. Uh, I'm not sure it, it is possible for me to ask a person to compile right. uh, MVAP uh, several times. Yeah. So, yeah, that may be more of an issue. Uh, so some of the MPI versions have to be 
are, are compiled with understanding of what's going on in the scheduler as well. So some of the some of the software depends on each other. Uh, but th this is the type of question that you would ask one of our analysts to work with. Uh, you know, so we have a number of people that uh, would be glad to help you out. Uh, I mean, th this is, goes beyond the scheduler issue and, and uh, to the MPI. Okay, thank you. I can um, ask you the emails later. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? If you guys are having an issue, we can look at this right now. there was something you guys did not understand, we can uh, demo it again. May I ask another question? Sure. Uh, about the memory, when uh, we ask uh, for more memory uh, that is available in a course, uh, does it uh, ask the memory from the other course or we uh, stay in the queue until uh, we have access uh, to a core with larger memory? So the way the scheduler works is basically it tries to find a server that has enough memory and enough cores that uh, are available for your job to run. So it doesn't actually wait for uh, that for the amount of memory per core to be available. It just it just looks for how much memory. It, it is what's it called uh, available on the node. So you can ask for you know six gigabytes of RAM per core and still run on the machine which has four gigabytes of RAM per core. Uh, that's really what's it called useful because not everybody asking for four gigabytes per core. So I actually have a slide in case somebody asked exactly that question. So we have some visualizations here at the end of this, these slides. Just so if we schedule both uh, cores and memory, you could see that uh, some jobs, what's it called, require many cores and a little bit of memory, while some jo jobs are using more memory than cores. And on each node, we have to make sure that we have enough memory and cores to r run your job. So we would start by running your first job and your second job here. We can see the amount of RAM that we have at the bottom and how much course we have here at the top and visualize that for the so first job. So it might impact the execution time, right? If we ask for a lot of memory that is not available in a core, then uh, because it's using the RAM from other cores, it might impact the execution time. Well, it won't impact the execution time. It may impact how long it takes for the resources to be gathered for your job to start. Uh -huh, so okay. when your job is started, that amount of resources is reserved for your job. So you can use those resources for your, that your job gets. Okay, so thank you. It shouldn't be any slower. Um, if you guys have any feedback about the uh, this talk, you know, was it too fast? Was it too slow? Was it too complex? Was it not complex enough? You know, not detailed enough. Uh, I'd also like to get that from you guys because this is the first time I give I've given this talk. Oh, another thing that you guys may want to see if you guys would like to see information. Uh, 
about scheduling in general and our training resources, if you go to the Wayne Westcott website, go to resources, training materials, you could see actually that uh, we have quite a bit of resources for training. And if you go down to tools and scheduling, there is uh, a whole bunch of schedule. There is, I think, six or nine hours of me talking about scheduling, uh, including some of these cheat sheets that I use about, uh, you know, running jobs. Also, what commands, what environment variables are there, and what commands you can actually use to get information on your job or what's available on the cluster or so on. So you guys may find that useful. Well. 